Please welcome to Summit Park from the Church Multiplication Network, Chris Raley. All right. Thank you, Summit Park. Good afternoon, everybody. Man, it's good to be with you here today. It's been a great weekend uh, to just hang out here at Summit Park. I've circled this weekend on my calendar for a long time. I mean, I've been looking forward to being here for really all year since we've had this planned. And uh, I'd heard about what God was doing here. Let me just tell you, your reputation has gone ahead of you, but it has exceeded all of my expectations just to be a part uh, this weekend and to hang out with the team here and to see, you know, what God is doing in this church. It's phenomenal. Uh, Pastor Scott, I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a big deal uh, to me that you would invite me to be here, and uh, your team is incredible, and I just uh, so appreciate your heart you know, your heart for people. Uh, you so clearly love this community and are about reaching people for Jesus and your heart to multiply. And uh, don't you have great pastors here? Can we just honor Pastor Scott and Jen and the whole team? I was looking at the brochure, which is really awesome to, to see kind of what's been going on and what the future holds. And, and I opened it up and I saw, man, 500 people have made a decision to follow Jesus. Some of Park's about five years old. That's like 100 people a year. And then I read the fine print, and that's just this year alone. Over 500 people. That's stupid. That's crazy. That's not normal. Man, it's incredible. And that really is all about your heart to share the gospel and meet the needs of the people around you and uh, keep going, Summit Park. Keep going. God has so much more in store for you. And uh, as Pastor Scott said, I get to lead the Church Multiplication Network, and we're almost now to 4,000 new churches that we've been able to help launch, churches like this. Uh, how many of you know the church is the hope of the world? And when you, you see all the, the issues and the problems and the division and the, the, the pain that's going on in our world, man, we do have the answer. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ alive in the local church is the hope of the world. And if we had a church like this in every community in America, our nation would be so different. So we're right there with you in believing for more uh, and multiplying. But I want you to know, uh, Summit Park, that last year, of all these churches, last year we recognized you in one of our events uh, as the church of the year and your pastors as the pastors of the year in our network because we see what God is doing here and we just honor you and celebrate with you uh, what God is doing here, your faithfulness to give and serve and reach and pray and believe for more. And I believe God has more, don't you? I believe our best days are still ahead. It's not a cliche. The best is yet to come. That's who we are as believers, that we believe that. That we serve a God of more, a God of abundance, a God who loves to give good gifts to his children, a God who loves to do things in us and, and through us. And so I want to encourage you today, as we spend the next few moments together, I pray your faith begins to arise and God begins to give you a glimpse of, of what he's got in store because that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the more that God has in store for us. And uh, I want to talk to you today from Joshua chapter 10. That's where we're going to be. Um, Old Testament story of God's people. And uh, so I want to read the first couple of verses, of Joshua 10, 12 through 14, actually. And then I'll break it down in a little bit. But let's take a look at what it says here. Joshua chapter 10, verse 12. At that time... Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. Here's what you need to know out of the gate, uh, that Israel, God's people, found themselves in another fight, in another battle. And if you know the story of God's people in the Old Testament, uh, they were either in a battle, coming out of a battle, or headed into a battle. I mean, that was like the story of God's people, Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, it's really our story, isn't it? You know, we're really either coming out of a difficult situation, we're kind of in a difficult situation, or we know there's more difficult situations ahead, such is life. But uh, God's people, Israel, were in another battle, and it's in this moment that Joshua prays this prayer, and he said in the sight of Israel, sun, stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. Now that's a bold prayer, isn't it? Sun, stand still. Uh, I, I don't Think normally to pray those kinds of prayers, pretty audacious thing to pray, but this is what Joshua prays. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation 
took vengeance on their enemies. The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. Listen to this. For the Lord fought for Israel. The Lord fought for Israel. The big idea of our time together, what I want to share with you is this. What do you do when you're in the fight of your life? What do you do when you're up against it, back against the wall, facing opposition in the fight of your life? I know in a room like this, there are many of us gathered here today that are in the fight of our lives. We learn to kind of put a smile on and walk through the doors and get our coffee. And those donuts look really good out there. You know, we get our donut, we come, find a seat, shake a few hands, and, and try to cover up what we're really going through because who really wants to hear all of our troubles and all of our challenges? And so we come in, go through the motions, go home. We start another week. But if we had time to really share with one another what's going on in this room, what the situations that we're facing are, I think we would realize there's a bunch of us here today that are right now, as you sit here, in the fight of your lives. Maybe your marriage is hanging in the balance. Maybe there's a relationship that is causing you strain and stress and tension and you don't know what to do. Maybe there's a decision that you have coming. It's looming and, and you don't know what you're going to do, the, the solution to the problem you have. Maybe you've gotten a diagnosis from the doctor. You haven't shared it with anybody yet because you know you've got a fight ahead of you. I don't know what it might be for you today, but there's a bunch of us in the fight of our lives. Let's just be honest about it. And then there's the fight that we're in as a church together corporately, the body of Christ. Uh, the enemy does not want the South Campus to win. The enemy does not want you to bring your friend here. He does not want you to grow in your faith, in your children, to discover who they are in him. The enemy does not want your business to prosper. The, the enemy wants to take you out and derail where you are in your walk with God. We are collectively in a fight. Church, the enemy does not want Summit Park to reach the people and meet the needs of this community. So I think part of what the Lord wants us to see today is we have to awaken to the fight we may not even know we're in. And what God wants to do in this church and through your family on behalf of this community demands that we wake up to the challenge ahead. The enemy does not want us to be successful. What do we do when we're in the fight of our lives? So Father, we pause and we thank you for the truth that's in your word and we ask that you would illuminate this to us today and apply it to our lives. Lord, we know this is not just some story of a, of a people in a galaxy far, far away a long, long time ago. This is the true story of your people, and it connects to the story that we're living out today. So God, show us from your word and show us from this story what you want us to, to know and what you want us to feel and what you want us to do when we leave here today. We give you thanks for all things. We know every good gift comes from the Father above. And so we give thanks, Lord, for that young prince, Patrick Mahomes. We give you thanks for him, Lord. We know you have brought him to us for such a time as this. And so we pray that uh, victory would be yours in the name of Jesus. We rebuke the Denver Broncos in the name of Jesus today. They want to come in and take what's ours. We rebuke them in the name of Jesus and believe this is a day of victory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, you're with me now, Chiefs fans. You didn't know who I was before. Now you know. Okay. Well, before I go any further, I want to introduce you to my family. Uh, I couldn't bring them with me this weekend, but I brought a picture. And uh, it always gives me more street cred when I can let you see who I'm associated with. So this is my crew, my wife, Kara, a beautiful wife, been married 19 years, if you can believe that. Yeah, thank you. Got married when we were 11. Uh, that's how we do it in Southwest Missouri. Uh, not really, but some people think that. And uh, my oldest son, Cannon, uh, he wants to be a pastor. He's 14. God called him to be a pastor. And you better believe I'm going to nurture that call every single day of his young life. And my middle son, uh, Caleb, he still thinks he's going to be a professional baseball player. No one tell him. He's got my genetics and it's never going to happen. That's his dream, though. And then my little son, Cooper, uh, he's nine years old now, and uh, we just love his smile. He lights up the room, and uh, we're at such a great stage of life with our boys. If you've got kids around that age or have had kids, you know, that's a great age. And, um, you know, it, they're able to now 
bathe themselves <laughs> for the most part. Uh, they clothe themselves and get dressed on their own. It's a beautiful thing when they reach that stage of life. Now the new thing is they can stay home by themselves for short periods of time. You parents remember when that happened for you? It's like freedom hits your house. You, you go to the grocery store for a couple hours, it feels like a vacation. I didn't used to go to the grocery store. Now I go. I walk the aisles for no reason. It's a vacation, right? Boys are at home. We're, we're on, a, on a date night, you know? It's just a wonderful time. And uh, it's been amazing to watch their personalities grow and develop. And you start to see their individual personalities and how God is beginning to speak to them individually and how their faith is beginning to, to be their own. And uh, my boys love Jesus. My boys right now, they love the church. And definition that I'm living out uh, for success, again, is not how much stuff I can acquire. It's not how many vacations we can take. It's none of the stuff that sometimes we confuse with success. I just believe now more than ever, success for me is when my boys leave my house. And they will leave my house in one day. When my boys leave my house, well, they still love Jesus and love the church. Growing up in a pastor's home, that's not a given, you know, and so that puts the pressure on us to live what we say, and, but I want my boys to love Jesus and love the church, and that's success for me, and we're watching our boys grow and develop, and, and uh, just a few months ago, one of the highlights of my life was to baptize my youngest son, Cooper, in water, and uh, it was just such a profound moment, I was standing there in the, the baptismal, there's a whole line of people waiting to get baptized, but I'm like, you have to wait your turn. This is my moment. I only get it once. I'm going to take my time in here. And, and I just began to, to speak over my son's life. I began to prophesy over his life. I, I began to, to speak truth into his life right there in the baptismal. And I'm watching as, as tears are welling up and begin to fall down his little eight-year-old cheeks. And it was so impactful to me to watch how Cooper was really understanding who he was in Christ and what Jesus had done for him and what this moment was all about. And one of the thoughts that I had was, I think I baptized my other two sons too early because they didn't get it at all like Cooper's getting it. But Cooper was getting it. And uh, so I dunk him down in the water and I bring him up and someone snapped this picture. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. I've got him up there like Lion King, holding him high and proud and... And spontaneously, Cooper just raises his hands in victory. No one told him to do that. He just felt the moment, like this was a moment of victory in his life, and he just lifted his hands like, like he just scored a touchdown, like there was victory. And I look at this picture now, I keep it on my phone, and, and I'll just stare at it, and I'll just begin to pray over this picture, pray over his life, because you know he's now nine years old, and uh, he's got so much life ahead of him, right? He's got so many disappointments he's going to have to endure. He's got so much temptation that's going to come his way that he's going to have to navigate. He's going to have so many people that are close to him that will let him down. And he's going to go through situations that are confusing and hard. And he's going to have some fights and some battles in life. And so I pray knowing what we all in this room know that life is hard. It's not easy. We get bumped and bruised and we sometimes create that for ourselves and sometimes it's other people's mistakes that cause us pain. And, and I know what's coming, so I just begin to pray and say, oh God, may he walk in that kind of victory every day of his life. May that be his posture before you no matter what's going on. Oh, don't let the enemy have his heart. Don't let the enemy derail him. Help him to overcome the temptations and help him to continue to understand who he is in you. And I just begin to pray that over my son because I'm like you. I know what's coming in life. It's inevitable, right? And then I, I get convicted in my own heart as I look at that picture. And I'm like, Chris, to be honest, I don't know if you walk in that kind of victory. I'm 41 years old, I'm a professional Christian. I've been doing this a long time and I've got maybe a little calluses that build up and, and a little uh, bruises from the winds and the uh, waves of life and, and I've been through some battles and I've been disappointed and I've gone through stuff. I've made some mistakes and sometimes after a while of walking with the Lord, we no longer have this posture of victory. We're just trying to hold on for dear life. 
We're just trying to uh, survive another day. We're just trying to crawl across the finish line of life. How you doing? Just trying to hang on. Or just trying to survive. You know, just trying to make it. Have you ever known some Christians who seem to have lost their joy, who don't posture themselves in victory, but act like the world is against them and they're just trying to survive another day? That is not, my friend, how God created us to live, to to be defined by our circumstances, to retreat into a survivalist mentality. God designed us to live a posture of victory no matter what's going on. And if I'm honest, sometimes I don't know if I carry myself in that kind of way. So I say, God, give me that kind of victory. Oh God, give me that victory in my marriage. Give me that victory with my boys. Give me that victory in my my career, my ministry, my life with my friends. I want that victory to define who I am. I don't wanna be defined by my circumstances. And that's hard. That's hard. Summit Park, that that is hard for us to walk out that kind of victory amidst the battles in the fights that we wage in our lives. That's what I wanna talk to you about today. How do we deal with the battles and the fights of life and still experience the victory that God has for us? I think it has a lot to do with what we actually believe, what we believe about God, what we believe about ourselves, and how we pray. What we believe and how we pray. I wanna break that down for you. And let me fill in the blanks of this story, okay? Let's come back to the people of Israel. As we come to the beginning of the book of Joshua, what we have is the nation of Israel on the banks of the Jordan River, and they're about to cross into the promised land. They've heard about this promise a long time, but it has seemed like an impossibility, a a distant reality that'll never happen. And and that can be how the promises of God feel. You got a promise a long time ago, but you're like, God, have you forgotten? Or God, was it true? I've been waiting, I've been doing good, but I don't think you remember what you said you would do in my life. Everybody else is getting blessed, where's my blessing? That's how Israel felt. 400 years in captivity in Egypt, oppressed, beaten down, slaves in Egypt, okay? They'd heard about the promise, but generations come and generations go and the years roll on by and nothing ever changes. Some of you have been discouraged and you've actually stayed away from church for a period of time because you don't think it has any real impact because it doesn't seem like anything for you ever really changes. I get it, I've thought that too. I've been there too. So they come out of 400 years of captivity, it's like out of the frying pan and into the fire because now they gotta wander in the desert for 40 years. I don't wanna wander in the desert for four hours, much less 40 years, that's a long time. Now, it was a little bit because of their disobedience, didn't obey the plan of God, but nevertheless, 440 years of waiting for the promise of God to become a reality, now they're on the banks of the Jordan. Moses is dead, Joshua is the new leader. And he casts this vision, he declares uh, this new day, and they pray together, and the waters part, the Jordan River parts, and they walk finally into the promised land after 440 years. So it's amazing. But now they've got all of these armies on the other side that they are not equipped to deal with. They got Jericho is first up, okay? You may have heard the story of Jericho. God gave Israel this very unique battle plan, to say the least, okay? He says, all right, I just want you to walk around the city for like a week. I want you to shout real loud and blow a trumpet, and that's how you're gonna get the victory. Really, God? Like, that's the plan? I'm gonna look like an idiot if I go back and tell them that's what we're doing. Like, that's what you want me to do? Yeah, that's it. That's what I want you to do. Walk around for a week, shout real loud, blow a trumpet. It's gonna work, trust me. Well, that's what they did, and it worked. So they take Jericho. The next up is a city called Ai, okay? And so uh, different battle plan. Basically, lay down, play dead. You're gonna ambush them. It's gonna be great. You'll take them. All right, we'll do that. And they did that, and it worked. So next up is a city. You can read all of this in Joshua 10. Next up is the city Gibeon. Now, Gibeon wised up. They were getting freaked out because they see the hand of God on these people. These nomads came through a river at flood stage. It just like parted in two. Is that the story? That's what I heard. You saw it? You were there? Yeah, saw it. Parted in two. Man, that's crazy. Then they conquered Jericho. They did what? They they conquered AI. How? Man, the hand of God must be on these people. We We can't take them out. Let's trick them. 
let's make a deal with them so they can't kill us and actually they'll have to protect us. And that's what they did. Israel gets tricked into making a deal. They weren't supposed to make a deal with anybody, but they get tricked into making this deal where they gotta protect these people. Wasn't God's plan complicated the situation? Have you ever, have you ever deviated from God's plan at a time in your life and it just brought complication into your life? Now you look back and you know, man, if I'd have, if I'd have done the right thing there, it probably wouldn't have complicated things. Israel, it was supposed to be a two-week journey. It was a deviation from God's plan. It took 40 years to get there. So it brought complication into their lives, been there a million times. That's what happens when we deviate from God's plan. So next up is the Amorite kingdom. And there's five kings, five armies. And these Amorite kings have seen what's been going on with God's people. And they're like, man, this is bad. This is a bad deal. They're gonna take us out one by one if we're not careful. Why don't we unite together? Let's bring all of our kingdoms together. All five kings form an alliance to come against Israel and Gibeon. So these, these, this is not a good situation. You gotta remember, Israel is a nation not of warriors, but of wanderers. They've just been wandering around. They don't have the weaponry. Uh, they, they don't have uh, experience as, as a military force. All they can do is whatever God says to do and hope that it works. They can't go toe to toe with anybody and they know it. And so now it's five against two. And Joshua knows these are not good odds. What's going on? And here's what God tells Joshua. I will be with you and I will fight for you. You know the greatest promise that we have in scripture is not of prosperity, it's not of pain relief. It's not, I'm gonna remove you from that difficult situation instantaneously all the time. It's not a lot of the things we hope it is, but the greatest promise we have of God consistently through scripture, from garden to new city in Revelation, is his presence. He promises to be with us. He promises his presence. You think about it, he created us, why? That he wanted to be with us. He pursued us after we sinned, why? I mean, the whole Old Testament is the story of God's pursuit of his people, why? Because he wanted to be with us. He sends his son Jesus, Emmanuel, what is that? God with us, right? He's creating a new heavens and a new earth that those of us who believe in him will one day be with him forever. This is the theme beginning to end. God says, I want to be and I will be with you and I will fight for you. And that's the word he gives and that's exactly what he does. In the story, he begins to rain down hailstones like the size of basketballs on the Amorites. That's a bad scene. That's a, probably a bloody, bloody scene when you think about it. He just starts raining down hailstones, boom, boom, just killing people. And so the Amorites retreat. Like, they're, they don't know what is going on, but they just start retreating. Joshua, as a good leader, starts to pursue these people, and it's, it's then when he prays this prayer. God, make the sun stand still. Bold prayer, audacious prayer. Here's the deal, though. Typically, when we read this story or we hear this story, we think that Joshua was praying for more daylight. Sun stands still so we can finish the job over our enemies. But Joshua wasn't praying for more daylight. Joshua was praying for more darkness. And we know that because of the geography that we typically skip over in stories like this. But the geography changes the story. Because what we know is the sun rises in the east sets in the west. So they're marching from Gibeon in the east to the valley of Aijalon in the west. And so they come from here, and Joshua, before the sun comes up, Joshua says, God, make the sun stand still in the heavens and moon over the valley of Aijalon. Why? So we can maintain the advantage that we have in this darkness. If the sun comes up and they see the situation, the momentum is gonna change in a hurry. They'll see again, they have uh, us outmatched in and outgunned. God, if you don't show up now and do a miracle, none of this is going to work. And so he marches all night and prays for more darkness, not more daylight. Think about, if you feel like you can take your enemy on, you want to do it in the day. Let's go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, right here in the middle of the day. But if you know you can't go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, what do you do? You try to surprise attack at night. You try to go ninja stealth style, right, where they can't see you. And that's what Joshua and the people are trying to do. So, as we think about, church, the fight that we're in, 
bring to the forefront of your mind, probably not that hard to do, what you're dealing with, the opposition that you're facing, the fight that you're in. Church, let's think about the invasion into enemy territory that we're trying to do as a church and to reach this community in the South Campus and here in the North Campus and hopefully in other campuses as we're reaching out to our friends. Let's, let's be aware of the fight that it will be, the fight that we're in. And there's three things from this story I wanna point out to you that I think will be a help to you as you deal with the fight of your life. And the first one is this, number one, admit the odds are probably against you. Isn't that an encouraging word today? You gotta admit, the odds are against you. What you're facing is bigger than you are. You don't have what it takes to overcome it. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I'm aware of my own limitations. I've got a track record now, 41 years of missing the mark and failing on a number of occasions, right? So the older I get, I don't get more confident about my ability. I become more aware of my own limitations. And I'm telling you, getting older is terrible. Front row, let me just tell you, getting older is terrible. It's no good. You know, I got pain for no reason. Wake up sore. Didn't even work out the day before, you know. Uh, you got to know now what a prostate's all about. Didn't know before. Now I got to know. And, uh, you know, commercials come on TV I used to make fun of. Now I'm scrambling for pen and paper to write down that toll-free number. You know, I need that. <laughs> I, I need what they're selling. Getting older is terrible. But one of the worst things about getting older is becoming very aware of your own limitations. And, you know, I've never really felt qualified to do what God has asked me to do. I've always felt like I didn't have what it takes. Every, everything God has asked me to do, I'm like, are you sure you have the right person? Are you sure, God? I felt a lot like Moses in, in those uh, stuttering before God saying, use, please use somebody else. I've never felt qualified to do what God has called me to do. When you're in a fight of your life, though, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is to underestimate your enemy and overestimate your ability. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we underestimate what we're really up against. Oh yeah, South Campus, no problem. Oh yeah, starting a new business, no problem. Oh yeah, having another child, oh yeah, starting school. No, I got it, no big deal. And we underestimate the opponent and we overestimate our ability. I believe God needs to kill that spirit in us if we're gonna get victory over the enemies that we face. He's gotta kill that thing that says, I've got it. I'm gonna pick myself up by my bootstraps. I, I know what I can do. I can take this, no worries, don't worry about me. We gotta kill that and we gotta to come to the Lord humbly and say, God, I don't have it. I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of my rope. This challenge is bigger than me. The odds seem to be against me. Lord, I need you to speak. I need you to give me a revelation. I need you to build my faith. I need you to show me a way out, a way around, a way through, a way over, because I don't know what to do. And it's that humility and dependence on God that caused Joshua to ask for more darkness, not more daylight. And it's that same humility and dependence on God that we need to win the fight that we're in. So let me go ahead and say out loud what you've probably at some time felt in your own life. I'll just say it out loud. No, you don't have what it takes, okay? You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're not gifted enough to do what you need to do to win this fight. You don't have the resources you need. Other people have, in fact, failed trying to do the same thing you're trying to do in the same place. Success may, in fact, seem unlikely. Doesn't mean it can't be done. Just means it can't be done alone. Aren't you glad today that we don't have to fight our battles alone? Aren't you glad we have a God that fights for us? Aren't you glad that it doesn't totally depend on our ability or our strength, but his power is perfect in our weakness and his grace is sufficient for us. Our God fights for us. And right now you may be in the fight of your life. Just admit it. Call it what it is. And you may not know the next step to take, so let's just go ahead and be honest about it. We don't know what to do next. It's bigger than we are. The odds are probably against us. But here's the encouraging point number two. Are you ready? Believe that God is greater than the odds. 
When you're in the fight of your life, it's good to recognize that that giant is bigger than me. But then you've got to know, but my God is bigger than that giant. I believe God is greater than the odds. Do you think God cares one lick about the odds? Do you think God cares about conventional wisdom? Let me just tell you, where conventional wisdom ends, the almighty God begins. Can I just talk about conventional wisdom for a moment? Conventional wisdom says, I should not be standing here today. 41 years ago, I was the result of an unwanted pregnancy. Somebody said, somebody's mistake. Enemy wanted to take me out before I was even born. Oh, but God said, no, 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 you can't have this one. I'm bringing him into this world, and I'm going to place him in the adoptive home of a mother and father who love me, and are going to teach this little boy to love me too. That's how good our God is. Somebody's mistake. Aren't you glad mistakes can be redeemed? Come on, somebody. Come on. God redeems mistakes, ours and other people's. And the enemy wanted to take me up. But here's the goodness. Here's the sovereignty of God. Not only did he save my life and bring me into the world, but he said, oh, I've got a plan for this one. I want him to, to tell other people all over the world about me. I'm going to raise up a preacher. Not good enough to save his life. I'm going to make him a preacher. So here's the goodness of God. He placed me in the incubator, in the adoption home of a theology professor. Oh, come on. How good is God? And he placed me in the adoptive home, the incubator of a, of a mom from LA. Okay. That's lower Alabama people. All right. And they don't just play good football down there. They know what prayer is supposed to be like, right? It's a full contact sport and women in LA know how to pray. So God in his goodness says, I'm going to make him a preacher. So I'm going to give him a dad, an adoptive father that's going to teach him the word of God. And I'm going to give him a mother, an adoptive mother that's going to teach him what prayer should sound like. Oh, not a bad recipe for a future preacher, the word of God and prayer. That's the sovereignty in the goodness of our God. And can I tell you today that the very thing you may be embarrassed about in your past, the very thing you might be ashamed about and don't want other people to know about you, because for a long time, I would never tell somebody I was adopted. You might have something you're ashamed about, but it might be that very thing you're ashamed and, and embarrassed about that God wants to use to bring hope to other people because he wants to tell a story of redemption through your life. We serve a God who does that. I should not be a preacher. I was a shy, insecure, full of doubt, scared to speak in public, if you can believe that, teenager. Oh, but God, oh, he filled me full of his purpose. He filled me full of his Holy Spirit. He molded and shaped my life and my mind and gave me the experiences that I needed to have to make me who he wanted me to be. And I just barely keep one foot in front of the other. But God shaped it all to create who he wanted me to be and what he wanted me to do. Come on, conventional wisdom, what's that? Conventional wisdom says we should not have had those three beautiful little boys miscarriage after miscarriage, after miscarriage, after miscarriage, with no answers and no hope in sight. But God did a miracle and gave us those three little world changers. Come on, don't buy in to conventional wisdom. The world is not inspired by a church that, that buys in to conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom says seas don't part in two when people walk across the middle. Conventional wisdom says trumpets don't make walls fall down. Conventional wisdom says little shepherd boys don't kill giants, and virgins don't have babies, and water doesn't get turned into wine, and the deaf can never hear again, and the blind can never see again, and the dead cannot be raised back to life. But God does all of that. Conventional wisdom, oh yeah, come on, shout somebody. Conventional wisdom says marriages cannot be restored. Addicts can't be set free. The old can't be made new. Your child can't come back to faith. That's all conventional wisdom. But God has done it all before. And if he did it then, he can do it again. How do I know? Because my God made the sun stand still, and that was just the opening act. Come on, somebody. We gotta have faith rise up in us. Not a thousand 
4,000 at the South Campus over time. Not two campuses, 10 campuses. The whole city coming to know Jesus. That sounds crazy. We can't do that. I know, conventional wisdom says it can't happen. But God wants to use this church and your messed up and broken life the same way he used my messed up and broken life for his glory. And when a church gets that kind of faith, when a church decides we're going all in, I'm not going to disqualify what God has qualified I'm going to be used by God. Oh, man, nothing can stand in the way of his church. Nothing can stand in the way of what God wants to do, but you got to believe. you got to believe that God is greater than the odds. He's greater than what's in front of you. The third point, when you're in the fight of your life, you got to admit the odds are probably against you. Just admit that. you got to believe with all your heart that the God you serve is alive, and, and he's greater than the odds. And then finally, this is kind of our action step. We've got to put ourselves in a position that requires faith. So much of our lives is trying to do what we can predict and control. People of faith don't like to exercise faith because it's scary, right? But there's a new position that we have to take. There's a disruption that has to come into our lives. You know, definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over and expecting some different result. Listen, if your life is not where you want it to be, your marriage or your family, if you believe God has something greater than what you're experiencing right now, there's a chance it's not him delaying. There's a chance it's a disruption that you need to bring to your life where you reposition yourself. Take a new position. Pray a new bold prayer. Get out from what you've been doing and do something different. Israel, Joshua, he marched his troops all night. Like he was going all in. This was a new position. He was going all in. They were worn out, marched all night, praised this bold prayer, knowing if God doesn't come through, this thing's gonna turn in a hurry and we're done for. It's a position that required faith, that demanded that God was gonna have to come through on their behalf. And that's scary. Trusting God is scary. Trusting God is the hardest thing I do. I've been walking with God a long time, and when I look back, I see his hand, I, I see his goodness, his faithfulness. It's good to look back. But when I look ahead, I get anxious, I get scared, my trust level goes down, God doesn't seem to keep up with me in my timing. You ever notice that? I wonder how it's gonna play out. I wonder what God's gonna do. I wonder if I'm making the right decision or not. And I I get all nervous and anxious. And trusting God is still the hardest thing I do after 41 years. Scary to give up control. But I've learned in, in my journey of faith that if I'm not a little bit scared, I'm probably not doing it right. This was never meant to be a faithless journey where we had every step mapped out for us and we knew how it was all gonna work out. Wouldn't that be kind of nice if we did? But God wants relationship. It's not about destination, it's about journey. And he wants to be with us and he gives us just the next step. And then he just gives us another step after that. And he says, will you trust me? Will you walk into the unknown? Will you put yourself in a position that requires faith? And it's scary But that's where God does the miracles. That's where God does the miracles, is when you step out into a new position. Pray a bold prayer and put yourself in a place that God's gotta come through. I remember when Kara and I stepped out to start our church, and much like the journey here, the leadership team, Pastor Scott and Jen, you know, this is a place that is built on the radical steps of faith of a lot of people over a lot of years. And I've heard so many stories from the team and from from you here about the steps of faith you've taken to be a part of this. And this is a place that's built on radical steps of faith. Our journey was similar, and God asked us to leave a comfortable position at a large church where we were well taken care of to go start a church. We had no idea how it was gonna work out, no idea where the money was gonna come from, no idea if anybody would come, and what if it closes, and then no one would hire us again because we were failures, and all these questions swirling around in our heads. What if it doesn't work out, and what if this, and what if that? I remember those early conversations with Kara. We were so scared. Well, how are we gonna provide for the boys, and what's this gonna mean for them, and where are we gonna live, and 
what if it doesn't work out and all these things? And I remember God interrupted that fear and he spoke to us and said, Chris, if you'll trust me in this, if you'll step out and just trust me in this, I'm gonna take care of your boys. He said, you're gonna give them the greatest gift you could ever give them. It might not be the right schools, it might not be a material possession, it might not be the greatest vacations or whatever the kind of stuff we wanna give our kids is. He's like, but you're gonna give them the greatest gift they could ever have. They are gonna have a front row seat to what real faith looks like. They're gonna watch mom and dad not just talk a good game, but they're gonna watch them live it out. And in the mountaintops and in the valleys, your boys are gonna get a front row seat to what trusting Jesus and walking by faith really looks like. And that's the greatest gift any of us could ever give our kids. Not to just bring them to church, but to teach them and model for them what radical faith looks like. God made the son stand still in our lives. And time again, we've been in those positions and God has made the sun stand still. Today, I wanna challenge you to risk failure for the glory of God. I wanna challenge you to take up a new position and put yourself out there. Put your neck on the line and put yourself in a place where God has to show up and do a miracle. And I don't know about you, but I wanna live the kind of life where you can't explain away what happens. You can't say, well, he married up, so I get why they've been successful. Oh, he went to the right school. He came from a good family. Oh, they gave a bunch of money. They have a great team there at Summit Park. Don't know how they got the building, but it's nice. So I get why they're growing. I get what's happening. That makes total sense. You don't want to live that kind of life where people can explain away what's going on. You want to live the kind of life and be the kind of church where the only explanation for the crazy miracles that are happening is that God showed up and did a miracle. Where he gets the glory, where the community looks, he goes, I don't know what's going on at that church. Their pastors are nice. They seem talented, but they ain't that talented. They ain't that good. They don't have that much money. The only explanation for what we see happening there is that God's hand must be on those people. That's the kind of faith I'm challenging you today to live because I think if we can get this as a church and you can get this in your family, it will transform what happens in this community. God will honor it, he'll bless it, he will, he will do miracles in your life. So I don't know what putting yourself in a position that requires faith is for you today, maybe for you, that position would be to go get into counseling before you know if it can be saved. Maybe it's to give generously before you get the raise at work, not after. Maybe for you, putting yourself in a position that requires faith is to get on a life team and serve, to not disqualify yourself and say it's not the right season and I'm not the right person, but to put yourself out there and say, God, use me, redeem my life for your glory. And you say, why, why would getting on a life team have anything to do with, with this? I'm just telling you that what God wants to do in the church is not disconnected from what God wants to do in your life. And when you follow his plan and get involved and you're a part of what God is doing in the corporate body, he makes the sun stand still in your life. That's how he does the miracle. They're not disconnected, they are the same thing. So get on a life team, get in a life group, give, be a part of what's going on here and watch what God will do for you personally in that journey. Maybe putting yourself in a position that requires faith is to commit to lead your family spiritually even when you don't yet know how to do that. Maybe it's saying yes to Jesus before you even know what the question is. God wants to do a miracle. This is a house of miracles. He's present here and when he's here, anything is possible. So here's the response to the message today. That's the worship team to lead us in one more song. I think the appropriate response would be for us in just a moment to stand and worship him one more time. And as you do that, in your own heart and in your mind, you may even say it out loud if you're bold enough, declare the fight that you're in. Say it out loud, admit to God in this place, you do not have what it takes to win this fight. And say, God, I'm here, I'm all yours. You just tell me where you want me to go, what you want me to do, what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do and I'll say what you want me to say. I'm all yours. I will put myself out there 
But God, you're gonna have to do a miracle today. Let's pray and believe together, not only for what he wants to do in your life and your family, God is up to something in this community. So would you stand together?